So let me open us up in a word of prayer and then we'll begin. Father, we do thank you for your goodness and grace and for this new day. And we do pray that as we um, interact uh, on our topic today and as we reflect on, on how the church can serve in, a, in an area of terrific uh, pain on the one hand and need on the other, uh, that you might give us a sense of one, what is going on, and two, uh, some sense of, of connection to this issue and reflecting on it. So we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, I haven't told you the topic yet. We'll work our way there. Uh, I'll go through my, uh, our guest today is Dr. Christina Crenshaw, lecturer of English at Baylor University in Waco. So she drove up uh, to do this today, but she also is a fellow at the Hendricks Center. She's worked with us over the past couple of years, and uh, and we're going to our topic today is going to be human trafficking. So um, so we'll be taking a look at that uh, in just a moment. Let me go through some initial announcements first for the center. Um, there is a giftedness workshop this weekend that is being held. This is, uh, you know, what makes you unique, what strengths do you bring um, as to who you are in analyzing that. But the exciting thing is I can announce that it's this weekend, but it's full. <laughs> so you go, well, why do you do that? Well, I do that because there's another one coming. <laughs> and, uh, and it's coming in September, so it's a little bit ways away, but if you want to plan and get in on something that has been proven to be a very um, useful uh, experience for a lot of students, you can talk to students who've attended this, then um, the openings will come up uh, for September 11th and 12th uh, for another giftedness workshop. The charge is $20, pretty basic to figure out who you are, so, um, you know, most people spend a lot more money to, than that to figure out who they are. So um, anyway, and if you say, well, I'm a believer, I don't need to pay for that. It's true. It's all God's grace. <laughs> so um, uh, then next, we have a conference that we're holding uh, at Northwest Bible um, this, uh, well, in a little more than a week from now on February 29th called The Right of Conscience. Um, Cultural Change in Medicine. We're actually partnering with the Christian uh, Medical and Dental Association and uh, the Christian Lawyers Association to talk about where medicine is today. What are the challenges in terms of practice, in terms of conscience currently, and where may our laws be going, and how does a Christian doctor or Christian lawyer negotiate that space, and what can and should theologians who advise in these areas um, say to people who are in that kind of a vocation. That's going to be at Northwest Bible Church on February 29th, and students are more than welcome, and that's a $30 charge, so that's more expensive than figuring out who you are. And then, uh, but it is a very much a discounted rate. Um, then the last announcement has to do with the relational wisdom brown bag. Now, when uh, I was told I was going to announce this. I said, so what is relational wisdom? Uh, relational wisdom is an extension of what used to be the peacemakers ministry. The person who had that left peacemakers to form this group because peacemakers dealt with what happened when things blew up in the church. Relational wisdom deals with uh, leadership and conflict skills to prevent things from blowing up. So it's preventative as opposed to restorative, if I can say that. And that brown bag will happen on Tuesday, March 24th in Campbell AC 110. So uh, keep that in the back of your minds. Um, you will be surprised once you get in ministry how much um, opportunity there is to deal with conflict. Um, and, uh, and being able to deal with it well is actually a key part of ministry. So that's an important brown bag. So those are announcements and with that I will turn to our topic and to Christina first of all thank you for being a part of this and for uh, coming here to share what your experience has been yeah thank you for having me and then um, uh, my first question always is on the is how did a nice person like you get into a gig like this so um, you told me to expect that one yeah that's yeah. right yeah. yeah 
Well, okay, to take you back um, a little bit into the journey of, of how I got involved with doing anti-trafficking work, I was teaching as an assistant professor out um, at California Baptist University. My husband and I were living out there. We, he had just finished his MBA. I finished my PhD at Baylor, and um, we, we moved out there to kind of do what we thought were our dream jobs. Um, was two years into the tenure track and um, realized that I was expecting my second son within 21 months of the first one. So two kids under two, and there was not a maternity leave policy. So um, I think this school has, has since gotten one, but spent a lot of time praying, just you know, listening for discernment, and really felt that I was um, supposed to, to take a little bit of a break, give myself a maternity leave. Um, and so in, you took a maternity I, leave. So I took, <laughs> I took a year-long maternity leave. Yeah. But, I, but you know, the Lord, the Lord knows me, and um, he knew that I needed something to work on, something a little bit outside the home to, re- to really feel like I was you know, flourishing in that season. And um, in that season, shortly after I'd had my second, the A21 campaign, Christine Kane's um, organization, contacted me. They had some relationship with my, my church back in Texas at, you know, at that time. And they said, you know, we hear that you have a, a PhD in education. We're looking for someone to help write and implement our um, high school curriculum bodies are not commodities. Would you be interested? And so they contracted me for a couple of months, um, and I would drive up to Orange County and work in their office one day a week and take the rest of the, the, the work home. And it's one of those topics that once you know, you cannot unknow. Um, mm-hmm. The Lord ended up calling us back to, to Waco, back to Texas, and Baylor graciously made some space for that for me to teach. Um, but this then became my research agenda. Um, it, I can't say that this started off. My dissertation was actually on how does the Christian worldview um, make us agents of change, specifically in the classroom. Um, but I would say that this is one of the ways that you become an agent of change, is by seeing the world's brokenness, seeing um, the depravity that exists around a topic like this, and saying, you know, where can I be light in the darkness? And so that thus began my, my research agenda with this and, and my engagement. Okay, and just to bring us right up to the current time, you're going from here to where <laughs> to do what? <laughs> yeah, so I, so I leave at 4.30 out of Love Field to go to a conference in San Diego. It's um, a national anti-trafficking conference where people come and present their research. Um, people from Harvard Medical School coming to talk about victims that they have seen and screenings that they're using, professors from other universities. Um, I'm actually, I've presented before on this curriculum, the H21 curriculum. We did a, a very robust study with 200 local students in Waco looking to see if there were any gains in the curriculum. You know, were we able to, you know, run an ANOVA, run a T-test and see, you know, pre and post were there gains. And this time I'm actually happy to present on our coalition. We have a really great um, coalition in Waco, Texas, and it, it takes a team of people. This is not something you can combat in a silo. So looking at the, the different grants that we've received, um, we really do have one of the leading coalitions in the nation. We've, we've gotten over $3 million of grant money from the Department of Justice and our Texas governor's office, which is another conversation we've had about what does that look like for the sacred, this anti-trafficking organization planted by a church, started you know as by a church to engage these, you know, secular, so to speak, public spheres of influence, and how do they play well in the sandbox? So it's been fascinating to see that happen. Okay, so let's let's take a dive into the topic. Now, most people, when they hear human trafficking, they're probably thinking, oh, yeah, that happens overseas. <laughs> uh, you know, um, that that's in other places far away. That doesn't happen so much here. Yeah. Um, simple question, true or false? <laughs> False. Uh, human trafficking happens everywhere, and Texas is actually the the second largest state for trafficking. California being first, yeah. and it and it, and it's significant numbers too, right? I mean, yes, yeah. So just um, um, for a long time, we didn't know. I mean, this is the, one of those underground crimes where it is difficult to get actual reporting and data on this. Um, Department of Homeland Security has good numbers. The Polaris Project, they have some pretty reliable data. But the University of Texas just two years ago did a a pretty groundbreaking study, and they found that in in Texas alone, there's over 300,000 victims of trafficking. Most of that is labor, but even just within sex trafficking, it's there's 79,000 minors. Um, and when when people ask why Houston's the number one traffic city in America, um, it's because we have you know we have international. Um, 
we, you know, we have international uh, airports. We've got freeways that run coast to, you know, or you know, east coast, west coast. So because of we've got ports, our our easy mobility um, that lends itself to, and the border we share a border, so that um, lends itself to a heightened sense of trafficking. So you referred in passing to labor traffic talk about that a little bit what how, what is that that's like a new category for me a new category <laughs> well i mean it, well trafficking is really one of the oldest crimes in history you know so when we talk i teach a class on this now at baylor and um, this semester we have our first class on that and at, at first baylor said well do you want to put it in an imaginative context where we look at the historical you know sense of slavery up until now and i said no i really just want to talk about contemporary issues mm -hmm. um but the truth is it it, it does have a very historical um, uh, context, very historical roots. Um, colonialism, you know, it is difficult to talk about modern day without looking uh, retrospectively. But labor trafficking um, exists, you know, everywhere. We see it in massage parlors, we see it in nail salons, we see it construction sites. It is harder to report actually than sex trafficking victims, because a lot of times labor trafficking don't identify, they don't self identify. Um, or our detective in town who um, we've spoken on many panels together, will come to the class, will say when I'm doing triage, you know, I'm always going to triage the 12 year old girl who is stuck in a motel over the 30 year old man at a, at a job website. And that that's just reality. But because of that reality, because they don't self identify, and because you know, we we're, we're minors um, usually take precedence, um, it doesn't get as reported. Um, as, as sex trafficking does. And it is harder to find and offer services to labor trafficking victims. Okay, now I'll just point out, you see the number on the screen. If you have questions you wanna type in to us, then we'll, in about uh, 15 minutes or so, we're gonna transition to those questions. So feel free to do that. And you can text in on the number that's up on the screen. Um, so let's talk about, uh, I mean, we could go into more detail about how pervasive this is, but I think you've already suggested it's pretty pervasive. Um, let me ask uh, two sets of questions and you can take them in order. Um, how, is the, how has or is the church connected with helping in this area and what kind of opportunities exist on the one hand? And then secondly, um, how can the average person on the street um, engage with this and it, and sometimes you hear um, advertising that kind of thing that says if you see anything strange you know mm -hmm. be willing to report it so so let let me do it in that order first what is the if you see anything strange thing all about um, if you see something say something um, I, I don't know if that's um, is is only relevant to, to human trafficking I think I've seen that in other contexts too um, I will tell. I'm going to answer your question with a story. Okay. And and it's um it's really it's a, it's a hard story, but I think it, it really answers the question we're talking about. We have a lot of vigilance on this issue within the United States. I've done a lot of international travel. I've you know done mission trips to Uganda and um, even just you know down to Mexico to Greece, um, and to Tunisia. You know, I've, I've done lots of different trips overseas. And I don't think I have seen um, this sense of justice. This is not necessarily a global shared sense of justice. We can talk, you know, all day about how that maybe comes out of our Judeo-Christian values. But when we were traveling two summers ago over to Greece to work in Syrian refugee camps, and we were there with an organization out of our church called Unbound to inform people about um, human traffickers and to warn them about people coming from camp to camp to um, to perhaps coerce or force them into, into this sort of trafficking. Um, we were on our way back. We were leaving Thessaloniki, going to Greece, and then going to DFW. And my husband and I witnessed a girl um, in line at the airport that we were we were fairly certain was being trafficked. And I'm not an alarmist. I'm, I'm actually usually one to kind of you know take more of a... I was just a little more hesitant because of my training. And so I kept trying to rationalize, like, surely not, surely not. Um, but she's 12 years old, scantily dressed, and she's with a man who's in his 40s, and he is inappropriately 
touching on her and kissing her in line. And so everyone sees it but looks away. No one wants to address it. So I go up to the gate agent and I say, hey, do you see what's going on? And she, I, I think she was more, you know, more perturbed and annoyed that I pointed it out. But she called security. And um, when security came, the girl ran through the airport, she took off running. And that's when my husband and I noticed there was a spotter in line and he went after her. So the three of them go and talk to security and whatever their story is, it checks out because they let him go. But then they are on our plane and we're watching the whole time. And I am just grieved in my spirit. And I'm just, you know, I'm praying, what do I do, what do I do? And I think, okay, well, when she gets up to go to the restroom, I'm gonna go back there. But he went back there too. So then I think, okay, well, when we land, I'm going to do something, I'm, you know, and I, I tell the flight attendant and she goes and tells the pilot, she actually went into the cockpit, uh, the cockpit. Um, and they're like, we can't do anything. And we land and I think, okay, well, when she goes into the restroom, but he stood in the doorway of the restroom. Um, and, and I remember watching her leave the airport and just go off into the abyss and, and feeling so defeated by that. But that, I think, was really the catalyst moment for when I said, okay, I'm going to use what influence I have, my sphere of influence, to do what I can here. I can't, you know, kick down every door and rescue every, every victim, labor or sex trafficking. But what I can do is raise awareness. And so that was a very empowering place for me to say, okay, this may not be within my domain of control, but, but this is. I can talk about this with my students in my Baylor classes. I can go to conferences and present research. I can partner with the church this says we want to start a coalition in our city that looks like bringing light into dark places. And so I think that, you know, even just on, on, on the big macro level, but even on the small micro level, that there are places within our sphere of influence where you can lend your skill set, your vocation to, to doing this sort of work. Um, every, every sphere of influence really is needed in, when we're talking about combating a crime this multifaceted. So um, the, uh, I'm, I'm assuming there is a way to report this in in the states in terms of when if, if you were in this situation say in an airport here locally yeah. it would be a different situation is that fair that is fair i mean 911 is always you know a gold standard you could call 911 and they could connect you to the national trafficking hotline i don't have the national trafficking hotline number memorized but there is there is one where you can report and we have our coalition has a facebook page that's really just meant for announcements but we get reports all the time for there and then we we send them to the McLennan County Sheriff's Office. Hmm. So um, I, I would say if you see something and you're suspicious to report it, but I would also say that not everything you see, I mean, some of it is just abject poverty or drug abuse. Um, and those are populations that are most vulnerable to trafficking. But I see all the time, you know, in, in rougher parts of, of Waco, the, the places where we really go to minister, um, situations that are just heartbreaking, um, but it's not necessarily trafficking. It could, it could be a number of other things. Okay, so let's talk about churches and their involvement. And, let, and maybe the way into this is to say, uh, you've mentioned the organization that you were originally connected with. Um, what are ways in which churches can be involved in dealing with uh, this, this area? Well, I think that the public square recognizes that this issue is so big and so broad and so heinous that it is going to take everyone to really address it. And it... I don't think it's lip service when the Texas governor's office says we need the churches. I think they recognize that this is a, a spiritual issue, that the, you know we as the church, we have a network of people who can do prevention, they can do rehabilitation. Um, and when we're talking rehabilitation, it's not just for victims. One of the things our coalition started was a rehabilitation program for the buyer and the seller. Um, which is something we don't talk as much about. You know, we, it's easy to have compassion and sympathy for the victim, but if we're going to talk about being, you know, a redemptive and restorative people, then that that has to extend to, to everybody. So we do a lot of, you know, pornography awareness trainings within our church. We do a lot of um, trainings um, about what it looks like to 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 buy and to sell. And um, the sheriff's department comes in, we have former victims come in. So um, a lot of what the church can do is look for places where, you know, where do I see brokenness? And where do I feel like, you know, I have living life inside of me, living, living water that I can offer to this place. Um, and it's amazing how even the public square 
is uh, receptive to that. Um, our um, Stop Demand School, that's the rehabilitation program for um, buyers, is funded through the Texas Governor's Office and it is held by an organization called Jesus Said Love. I mean, that's not, only God could do something like that, mm. right? So I, I think that, you know, that probably the Texas Governor's Office wishes it was a different agency, but they recognized that the church raised their hand and said, we'll do this. Now, there are also uh, obviously parachurch organizations and that kind of thing that work in this area. Can you talk a little bit about them? Yeah, so um, technically our Unbound, the anti-trafficking organization in our town is a parachurch organization that was started out of our church in town, but now has its own 501c3. Um, Jesus Said Love runs as its own parachurch organization. But then we have, um, you know, like the Family Abuse Center. We've got um, uh, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. These are organizations that are not faith-based in any way also sitting, you know, at our coalition table. Um, you know, as, as, as sticky and messy as it is to, to think about this, I remember having a coalition meeting, a hundred community stakeholders at, held at our church, so the church is housing this citywide meeting, and in the room, just a couple people away from each other was um, the organization CareNet, which is, is there to, to help pregnant women in crisis and Planned Parenthood you know, in the same room. And I just thought this is such a really beautiful picture of what it looks like for community to come together completely theologically, philosophically on different pages, but all here because we recognize that trafficking is, is stealing from um, stealing from the souls of, of our people and our children, and we're not okay with that. So um, this has been one of the most bipartisan efforts I've ever been a part of um, mm. in the sense of you know politics, but it's also been one of the most unifying things I've ever been a part of as far as you know when we're talking about church and state. Mm -hmm. So now um, let's we'll talk about the victims for a second. Um, you've done a lot of talking about about young girls in particular. Is the young teenager the most vulnerable, or does it expand? span a larger age group, generally speaking? Well, vulnerable is what traffickers look for. And mm -hmm. so vulnerabilities can be socioeconomic status. They can be um, instability at home. Um, really, the more vulnerable, the, the, the kinds of kids who are already vulnerable to homelessness, to um, instability with food provision, those are the, the ones that are vulnerable to being trafficked. But even within that, there's always there, there are always outlier situations. We had a, a student who was in high school um, who was a cheerleader, you know, A, B student. Her parents were going through a divorce, and she ended up meeting a guy who was 12 years older than her, and he ended up trafficking her out of, out of Waco. Um, so that, that certainly does happen, but primarily speaking, it is, it's vulnerable populations. Um, 12 is about the average age that kids are, are groomed by a trafficker, mm -hmm. and typically traffickers are, are now reaching students, uh, their kids, through social media, mm -hmm. um, through different apps, through the phone, through Facebook. It used to be that, and this has thankfully been shut down, but there was a, a black market website actually that you could sell people on. It was just a year and a half ago that that was shut down, batpage.com. Um, but that was another place where people were going to look for people, sell people, perpetuate this. But traffickers really have just moved on to other platforms. Um, most people who are trafficked have had some sort of trauma in their past, even if they're trafficked as an adult. Um, very rarely do you see a situation where someone has fallen into being trafficked, um, particularly sex trafficking labor as well, without trauma in their past. Um, the statistics on how many have been sexually abused as kids are very high. And we've even heard stories of um, victims and survivors who will say, this is what I knew of my childhood. You know, why, why would it be any different from my adulthood? You see a lot of trauma bonding mm -hmm. occurring with their, with their trafficker. And so it makes it difficult for them to leave because their needs are being met. So that to say, it's, it's difficult to paint any like one stereotype of who becomes trafficked. But I think that the common thread they all share is is a vulnerability that they were vulnerable and a trafficker preyed on that vulnerability now how long have you actually been working with this well so my youngest is six mm -hmm. so i guess six years it was mm -hmm. right after he was born so it's yeah it's been about six years mm -hmm. okay well let me turn to some of the questions now um uh 
uh, here's this is a question I guess aimed at what someone might be called an idealist. It says, "Do you believe that the end it movement's goal of seeing human trafficking end in our lifetime is realistic?" That is a, oh, that's a tough one. I, no one wants to say no to that, right? Um, <laughs> I would say there, a, a friend of mine, uh, Victor Boutros, who started um, the Human Trafficking Institute in DC, um, a Baylor graduate, he and his partner, uh, John Richman, who is the ambassador to Trump for, for anti-trafficking work, started this organization. And he says his goal is to decimate human trafficking because DESA, meaning the word, you know, 10, 10%. So his goal is to eliminate global trafficking by 10%. So that feels like a much more attainable, realistic goal. Um, I do think for purposes of the passion movement, which is what, you know, End It Movement is coming out of, um, it really does rally students. You know, my students aren't quite as interested in the measurable outcomes as they are the movement. Um, so I, I really am thankful for the movement behind anti-trafficking work. Can we obliterate it? I mean, we haven't in all of human history, but I do think that we can make a difference. I, I agree we can decimate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there a technical difference between labor trafficking and slavery? Well, we call human trafficking modern day slavery. So I would say in those semantic senses, you know, probably not. Um, trafficking itself, there has to be an element of um, force or coercion coercion um, or fraud. Those are the three definitions and that somebody has been exploited for profit. Um, so Texas, for example, has very clear definitions on the difference between um, sort of illegal immigration and trafficking. Now, the areas are very gray. You know, it, oftentimes somebody comes willingly and then they are, you know, forced or tricked or, you know, or um, and become trafficked. So that happens often. But for purposes of definition, someone who voluntarily comes versus somebody who was, was dragged it, it has a difference in, in what we would consider trafficking. So what I, I take it that the difference is, is that in some cases the offer is... Um, uh, an, an offer of money for, theoretically for, for services rendered and then the services change, if I can say it that way. Right. That, and that often happens. Um, you know, they'll pay a coyote to come across. That coyote ends up becoming the trafficker or sells them to a trafficker. Trafficker withholds their, their papers um, and then forces them to work back for a wage, a bonded debt, and they aren't able to ever really climb out of that bonded debt. We had a case just last summer in Waco. It was, um, the restaurant was called the Vegas Buffet, and it always looked suspect, but people would go there, you know, eat there, um, and our sheriff's department did an undercover operation sting where they went in several times looking for certain things and it turned out that the, the people who were employed there were victims of labor trafficking. They had had their um, passports confiscated. They slept on mattresses in the back and worked 12-hour shifts for six days a week. And so that was a clear example of labor trafficking. That mm -hmm. is not what they thought they had signed up for. And then often with an illicit massage parlor, we'll see that too, labor trafficking for forced to work, but then also this concentric overlap with, with sex trafficking. So, yeah. And then you, uh, uh, in telling that story, you talked about a coyote. So I'm saying some of the, some of the instances involve the way in which immigration is handled and takes place and the vulnerability of a person coming into a new culture with no resources, right. et cetera. And they're just looking to be able to to survive. Right. And then they don't always know where to go for help. Yes. Yeah. So it is true that some people come under what they assume are authentic um, circumstances and then um, end up being tricked and trafficked and trapped. So that, that certainly does happen as well, um, particularly with labor trafficking. Hmm. Yeah. It says, are the instances of kidnapping or women being followed in public as prevalent as social media um, makes those seem? If so, what are the best ways to be on guard? So I have heard our uh, sheriff's department answer this. Joe Scaramucci is our human trafficking detective. And he would say that, no, it's not nearly as prevalent as social media makes it out to be. Um, it's not that kids are not 
kidnapped. You know, I grew up in the 1980s and 90s. Stranger danger assumed everybody was out to to kidnap me. It never happened. Um, but I was thankful that there was this sort of vigilance and, you know, like making sure that I stayed near home and my parents and knew where to go for help, that sort of thing, because it does happen. But that's not the, the primary way that people are trafficked. Um, typically, these are kids who are runaway. One in five kids who are um, in the CPS system will be um, approached by a trafficker and, and then often trafficked. And that actually is a statistic that makes me really sad because those are kids that we even have taps on in our system, in our CPS system. Um, but because they've fallen through the cracks, they've, again, have these vulnerabilities and nobody is, is really meeting that need. The, that is what traffickers are looking for. And they end up befriending them. We call it grooming. They become friends with them. Kids become dependent on them. We even have this term that we really, we use within our, our, our circle of, um, of conversation with this, but they call it survival sex, where a minor will actually choose to sell herself. But then of course, she's under 18. It wasn't a choice. We still deem it trafficking. But it's this exchange for getting their, their needs met, whether that's Maslow's hierarchy of emotional needs, or we're talking actual food, shelter kind of needs. Um, so we, it's a very convoluted, complicated situation. Um, but rarely is someone just kidnapped. It, it really is more they befriended them and then ended up exploiting them. So, so sometimes at the front end, it can look like there's consent when in fact there isn't consent. Right. And just to be clear, if they're under 18, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. matter. Yeah. Right. Yeah. By terms of legal definition, it mm -hmm. does not matter. Um, here's an interesting question. Um, is it appropriate or helpful to ask a nail technician or massage tech, et cetera, if they're working there on their own free will, and if the answer is no, then what? What would be the next steps? That is a hard one. Um, I mean, hats off to this person for being brave enough to ask that person. Um, I think, you know, you border on you don't want to be offensive, you know, if they are there and they're not under some sort of, you know, um, suspicious auspice or guys, you know, they're there by their own volition. But I, but I would say in that sense, I would probably call the sheriff's office or I would, you know, maybe call a hotline. And just if you see suspicious behavior, that's what I would, I would um, say needs to be, you know, the correlation. If you see suspicious behavior, erratic behavior, um, one of the things that tipped off our sheriff's department was that um, somebody who had gone to this Vegas buffet, was looking for the restroom, went through the wrong door, and then saw mattress, you know, a mattress in the back. Like, that's not normal to have a mattress at a restaurant. Called the sheriff's department, then they did an investigation. It takes months to build a case, I've learned. Um, lots of surveillance, lots of, you know, going in, interviews, that sort of thing, to actually build a case when you're doing a sting operation. Um, so if you're suspicious and you, and you see see something again, maybe call somebody and say something. But if it, I wouldn't necessarily assume that everybody working in a nail salon is, is not there by choice. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, we probably should have done this at the beginning. Please define what trafficking is and is not. Okay. So we got a little bit about that with, yeah. um, with, um, illegal immigration. Um, but, but really it's anybody who is exploited, uh, for profit. So when we're talking about labor trafficking, we're talking about the exploitation of people through their labor. When we're talking about bonded debt, uh, when we're talking about, you know, sex trafficking. So anybody who is exploited in a forced situation and is, um, and, and their body has been commodified and they are now being sold for, for profit. How do you not get overwhelmed by the vastness of this issue? You know, I get asked that a lot, and here's what I think it is. I've done a lot of reflection over the years when I get asked that. I focus mostly on the preventative side, prevention education, teaching high school students, teaching Baylor students. Um, it feels actually more empowering than de defeating or, you know, fatalistic. I will say that I do have to take breaks. I get articles sent to me all the time, um, as you can probably imagine, you know, friends and colleagues, um, you know, read one at the beginning of the year, Washington Post, about how the FBI is asking every entity with which it works for help. They are so overwhelmed with the amount of images online that they can't even keep up. So they're having to enlist um, other tech agencies for help. 
Um, and so I think that that it does get disheartening, but I, I pause and I come back to um, this place where I say, this is redemptive and restorative work. And the, it's a place where you can see clear brokenness and a clear opportunity for restoration. And so what I see, not always in the, in the micro day to day, but when I kind of step back and I look at the macro landscape, I can see the gospel at work in this. And so that gives me hope. I think if I wasn't seeing that redemptive process, if I couldn't see the stories of victims who have become survivors, the, it, I, I don't know if I could continue. But when you see the gospel in the work you're doing, in the larger narrative, it really gives you the, the wind you need to keep moving. Okay, now this may seem like a strange question, but I'll take a shot at it anyway. Um, <laughs> and that is, let's assume I'm in a church and the church doesn't know anything, hasn't done anything, et cetera. So how do you get started or what advice would you give to – create a space so that the church could walk into this kind of an area? Um, well, I would say first, don't feel like you need to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of great organizations out there. I am, you know, imagine even locally, you could you could find some. Unbound that I work with in Waco has um, global offices. They have some domestic offices too. The A21 campaign I imagine um, Traffic 911 is located here in the Dallas area. So I think reaching out to somebody you feel is like-minded enough that you would trust to bring them into your church and ask them to speak on it. They'll do fundraiser drives. We have a big one coming up in March um, where Chick-fil-A has partnered with um, the organization and we do like a fun run. Kids get involved. They do a nugget run. <laughs> and um, I know it's cute. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm giving my students extra credit for volunteering, um, that sort of thing. So I think that once you find an organization you trust to bring into your church, you know, sphere, um, that there's going to be natural ways to, to partner, you know, again, fundraisers, raising awareness. If you have a gift of teaching and education, they need trainers. They need trainers um, to go in, into the community. So first I would start with who do you see doing this work that you would trust to partner with and, and let them kind of tell you what their needs are. Okay, let's use A21 as kind of an example. Tell us a little bit about what they do and how they, how they work in this space. Yeah, so A21, is their headquarters are in um, Orange County, but they work globally. I want to say they have about 15 different offices globally. Um, a lot of what they do domestically is um, awareness campaign. Like they, they work with Indi um, the Indit movement. They're at Passion Church a lot um, doing that. Um, so a lot of their efforts are more awareness. You can jump on board with them and do like an awareness campaign in your city, in your school. They have this anti-trafficking curriculum now that if you're an educator you know educators you can encourage that to be integrated into the classroom um, they have some rehabilitation centers but as best I know those are overseas um, so if you were a social worker and you wanted to volunteer time to do that um, but a lot of it is just raising awareness campaigns uh, fundraising donation um, even within our city you know thinking about the myriad of ways that students get involved um, the, you know, they want to be the ones kicking down the doors and riding in the back of the, the patrol cars like, and saving people. Um, and there is a time and space for that, but it also it's a good opportunity to remind students like you need training for that. You know, mm -hmm. you, you have to grow into the, the right to be in that in that space. So um, but yeah, I want to share this story real quick because. It just moved me. A student of mine, I asked on the first day of the human trafficking class, how did you guys hear about this? How did you get involved? And one of my students said, when I was a senior in high school, I was in a dance competition, and one of the, our competitors did an entire dance dedicated to, to ending human trafficking. And the room got really quiet, and I just thought, I will never again say that that is, that, that, that is lip service, that anybody can fight trafficking. I just remember that resonated so deeply with me, like anybody can lend their vocation to fighting trafficking you know so really whatever it is your skill set accounting they need accountants you know we um, more economics numbers on this really we estimate it's a 150 billion dollar industry mm. like we need people who have um, an economic mind to figure out how do we break this down 
How do we how do we prevent the the business transaction side of this? Now, I ask a question I get asked when I get interviewed all the time, and I almost never have an answer for it, but we'll go, is there anything <laughs> I've left out, anything else you want to say that we haven't addressed? Um, and do most people say no, that about covers it? Yeah, they, yeah, exactly say, right. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know that I would say there's anything that we haven't addressed. I would say that if you are doing work with vulnerable populations, then you are indirectly also working to end human trafficking. You know, there's so much concentric overlap with, again, you know, homeless kids and hunger. Um, and refugee ministries. Refugee ministries, yeah. yes, absolutely. So I think if you're working in those spheres already, then, then know that you are part of this abolitionist movement to help end trafficking. That, again, we can't do this in a silo. Like, we need everybody who is walking with the broken and the vulnerable to, to help raise awareness. Um, a book I want to recommend really quickly my students just read. It's Raleigh Sadler's um, Vulnerable, and um, they just read it. It's a faith-based perspective on what churches can do to end human trafficking. But in there, he talks about how really, at the end of the day, we're all vulnerable. We're all vulnerable. It's why we need. That's why we need Jesus. Um, but when we approach it from out of my vulnerability, I want to walk with your vulnerability. You, you watch the gospel transform lives. So that was a really great book on this topic. Okay, say, say it one more time so people get it's it. It's called Vulnerable. Um, I'm not sure what the, the, subtitle. the subtitle is, but yeah. Vulnerable. And um, Raleigh Sadler, and he is the founder of Let My People Go out of New York, um, who does this kind of work. But um, it's been endorsed by a lot of great people. Um, so you can you know, read the endorsements, the reviews, but it's it's a good book on what does it look like for the church to walk with people who are vulnerable, specifically vulnerable to trafficking. Hmm. Well, let's thank Christina for spending time with us. <laughs> Wish you well as you address the conference and thank trust you. that that'll go well. And um, it's been great to have you as a fellow on the, on the Hendricks Center team. Thanks. It's yeah. an honor to be here. Let me pray. Close us. Father, we do um, come before you and we're just reminded of how broken our world is and uh, how there are people who are not only vulnerable and at risk, but are being taken advantage of in ways that are even um, horrific to contemplate, and yet other people are quite comfortable in using and abusing people in this way. And our prayer is, is that you would uh, keep us sensitive to what goes, around, goes on around us that sometimes we may want to shove away and not have much to do with and not think very much about. And yet, in the context of what the church is about, is an opportunity for really uh, restorative ministry that uh, might rescue not only a person's body, but a person's soul. And so we ask you to make us sensitive in this regard and to uh, encourage our communities to think about an area like this as something that's so pervasive and that uh, in doing so, we might bring honor to you in, in the process of, of seeking to be of help, uh, see people rescued out of a trap that is so debilitating. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.